Welcome, welcome to this webinar. Good. Um, welcome to this webinar, the second webinar in uh, EW Nutrition's uh, AMR webinar series. Um, title of today is Will Antimicrobial Resistance Impact Our Businesses and Our Lives in the, in the Future? Um, my name is Twan van Gerwe and I am a Global Technical Manager within EW Nutrition. It's my pleasure to host this session and to introduce our two exceptional presenters to you. First, we have Professor Bruno Gonzalez Sorn. Uh, he's the head of the Antimicrobial Resistant, Resistance Unit at Complutense University in Madrid. He gained his DVM in 1996, studying in Spain and in Germany, and his European PhD he obtained in 2001. Currently, he leads research projects on molecular microbiology and the ecology of antimicrobial resistance and his interests focus on the ecology of antimicrobial resistance, including humans, animals, food, and the environment, and focusing on genomics from a One Health perspective. So with this background, you can imagine the level of scientific and solution-oriented expertise of today's speakers. Um, Bruno, welcome. Hello, thank you. Nice to be here with you. And then uh, next we have Nan Derek Mulder. He is a senior analyst, animal protein at Rabobank and covers the industry from an international perspective. He's based in Rabobank's headquarter in Utrecht, the Netherlands. So before his appointment at Rabobank in 2001, um, Nan Derek worked for the product boards for livestock, meat and eggs in the Netherlands. Um, he graduated in agriculture economy, marketing and market research from the Netherlands Wageningen Agriculture University and has been uh, uh, um, has advised and participated in, in projects on all continents of the world. And he is a regular speaker at conferences and seminars and with us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, with me, I have one panelist uh, who will support me during the uh, webinar, both with content and with technical issues. Uh, Andreas, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Andreas Miguel. I'm head of biotechnology at EW Nutrition Innovation. As such, I had the research activities, mainly biotechnology in Germany, and I will basically will contribute to the scientific side of the discussion. Thank you. Good. Um, together, uh, Andreas and I, we will help answer questions during uh, and also after the presentations if needed. Uh, questions can be asked through the webinar in the Q&A panel, which you find at the bottom of your screen. So some will receive instant replies from us and some will be picked up and answered in the live discussion that will follow the presentation and the panel discussions. Um, we will be recording this session and the session will be made available uh, through our website in the coming days. So, um, and uh, for now, I would say um, we'll start with, uh, with the presentation of Professor uh, Bruno Gonzalez Sorn. Um, Bruno, the floor is yours. Fine. Thank you very much. If you, yes. You can see the slide? Not yet. Thank you. Not yet? No. There we are, right? Perfect. Okay, good. So thanks a lot for the for the introduction and thanks a lot also for for, for giving me the opportunity to, to be with you like the next uh, 10, 12, 13 minutes maybe, um, where I can share with you the, my, the, the, my views about antibiotic resistance and, and how we made it to this and why. And uh, well, I hope not, not to bore you too much. 
So as you know, bacterial diseases are very important today. You don't, you may, maybe you're not really aware of it, of it because now we are in this COVID crisis, et cetera. But in fact, these diseases, lepra, tuberculosis, they, they kill million, millions of people. And uh, it's bacterial diseases that have spread also worldwide. And they are currently, as I say, killing many people. And as I, as I said, if we, we have to think of history and it's very important to take into account history. I said, I said COVID, we have to take into account what happened with the influenza uh, crisis. We didn't uh, learn very much from the crisis from 100 years ago. And that's why we are not managing it very well today. That's my opinion. So the same may, may happen with this. This is a bacterial disease plague that spread all over the world and killed more than 100 million people. So the only moment in human history where the amount of homo sapiens, so that's us, um, decreased since the beginning is only because of one bacterium that became strong in the world and spread worldwide. So single bacterium out of control is quite dangerous, can be very dangerous for humanity. Until, as you know, we started to control bacteria. Uh, bacteria. That control of bacteria came mainly because of Fleming discovered penicillin because uh, in his plate uh, when he when he went on holidays and he came back, he saw that his staphylococci were not growing very well besides the, that mold. And then he, he uh, discovered with other people and so on, penicillin. And from there on, we started to control bacteria. This is more or less between the first and the second world war. So all the millions of people that died in the first world war, it's mainly because of infections, bacterial infections because of wounds. The second world war is more bombs, etc. But the reason is because we mastered already um, uh, bacterial infections. So wounds were not enough to win a war. So my, uh, my, my personal opinion, and I hope that also the ones of you in 10 minutes, is that the greater discovery in hum human history was in fact uh, the discovery of antibiotics. Here you can see the plate, the original plate of Fleming, and, we, it, and he was, and then himself, but he was developing antibiotics especially penicillin, and you can see the great impact that this, could, this had immediately on humans. So you can see, for example, the infant mortality, how it was reduced, thanks to the fact that we were able to control bacteria. And for example, the life expectancy, how, how it increased so much since those years where we started to control bacteria, so we had tools to uh, kill bacteria and control bacterial infections. And see the impact that this had on human populations that I think we, today we are here more or less because of this. Since those years, 40, 50, look how, what an incredible increase we have had in the human population. I had a student, um, 16 years old, eh, when I gave a talk there in a, in a school, and then she, she saw a picture similar like this one. She said, so with the discovery of antibiotics, we broke the equilibrium. And that's not, that's not stupid. I, probably she's right. So we started to, to, to master diseases very well suddenly, and we broke the equilibrium Earth human beings. And this is what we are heading to be 9,000 million people on Earth. And that is uh, nice that we are so many, but in fact, or, the, or that we are so successful handling diseases, but this is disadvantages. And we'll see how to get protein for all of us, healthiness, and so on and so on. So, so that, that was quite interesting. But the fact is that now um, we are so many people, we must our health, and uh, we are, have now this new problem of what do we do being so many. And in fact, all the modern medicine has developed so well because we master bacteria. So we can change organ, organ transplantation, treatment of cancer patients, etc. All this is only possible. All these surgeries that we overcome day, day by day is only possible because we master and we control bacteria. And after this uh, and, and, and discovery of penicillin, many other, other, other researchers did more or less the same approach as uh, a Fleming. And that is to go out there in the environment and to take those bacteria microorganisms from there to see which ones were producing bacteria. So these were uh, antibiotics. So these were the golden ages of the antibiotic discovery. So in the year 70s, 80s, more or less, we had like too many antibiotics in the market. So for every single bacterial infection, we could choose between seven, six, eight different antibiotics to treat properly patients. So the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, then developed and other kinds of molecules, abandoned the, the, the antibiotic discovery, and went to discover HIV, for example, molecules. Thanks to that, by the way, we, today, the life expectancy of HIV patients is the same one 
case of the patients that are not infected with HIV, or molecules against cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the other pharmaceutical industry decided to do other things, and they did other things very well for humanity. I say this because sometimes people blame the pharmaceutical industry. Oh, they have abandoned antibiotic discovery. Yes, but in the meantime, they did other things that were also very good for humanity. But they abandoned, it's true because we had too many antibiotics. So now the fact is that we have, been, we have not discovered a single new family of antibiotics in the last 30 years. And by using all these antibiotics, now we have a lot of resistance and very few antibiotics. And in fact, that's why every year there are meetings in the WHO to see what critical antibiotics we use in animal health that are critical for human health. This is revised every year. This was published last year. And as you can see, all these antibiotics if you are uh, used to them, it's the antibiotics that are used currently and normally in animal medicine. And we have to preserve the efficacy. Why? Because if we don't react now, the, the, the estimates are that for 2050, 10 million people will die every year of antimicrobial resistance, not, for, not of bacterial infections, because of bacterial infections being resistant to antibiotics. Okay, that's more or less, that's more or less five, COVID pandemics per year. So this we want to avoid. This is what this was a, 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 a picture a picture with uh, uh, Jim O'Neill who published this 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 report. And as you can see, the distribution of deaths mainly Asia, Africa, but also Europe. So it, it affects uh, it affects all the world. So if we are agree that antibiotics were so incredible for humanity, obviously the most important problem that we have in humanity today is antibiotic resistance. It's not a personal opinion. It was a personal opinion of myself and of uh, the, some other people until 2016, where the United Nations decided unanimously that the greatest problem in humanity was antibiotic resistance. And it's not so frequent that the United Nations say that the health problem is a, the greatest problem of humanity. It was that has only happened four times, now with COVID five times in all history. So it's not so frequent that they all think together that one health problem is a problem. So that was antibiotic resistance in 2016. I believe that in 2016, and I'll, I'll get back to it, that, that with COVID, this, we have a small parenthesis, but we'll come back maybe to a problem that is even, you know, even worse after the COVID pandemic. I will come back to that afterwards. So in fact, it's not only the, the opinion of the United Nations, but also the G20 when they came together in 2017, for the first time they said that there's a one health problem and the problem is, and, uh, is of antimicrobial resistance. And they, they, they would build a collaboration hub, political, very high level, to fight antibiotic resistance. I assume, I don't have to tell you what one health is. It's taking together environmental health, animal health, and human health together under, under, under one umbrella. And that umbrella is one health. Afterwards, in 2019, they still said, we have to accelerate efforts against with a one health perspective. And even in March 2020, this meeting was online. They said that with such pandemic, preparedness and antimicrobial resistance is very important, is the most important. So even within this, this pandemic, we know that antibiotic resistance is still the greatest problem that we have. And this is why also we have built a, an international hub um, and that we are building a virtual institute worldwide to do research on antibiotic resistance and how to tackle it. The problem, as you may know very well, is that bacteria don't keep, when they, once they are resistant, they don't keep this res resistance mechanism with them. They share it horizontally with other bacteria. And that's why antibiotic resistance spreads so fast and so well between bacteria. So the problem is that when we give or when we take away an antibiotic, the problem is not only that the pathogenic bacteria get resistant, but also all the bacteria from our gut get resistant. And they get this, they maintain this antibiotic resistance genes. And then they will spread it to all the other bacteria. Even if there's a susceptible salmonella or pathogenic bacteria coming in, it will get this resistance genes from the commensal bacteria. So commensal by giving an antibiotic is always producing resistance of even if we cure the patient, because the, 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 the population of the microbiota of the patient will still uh, and, and be, be resistant. So you can say, yes, well, probably, yeah, I've heard about that a lot, and it's probably starting to be under control. Nothing more far away than that. This is the maps of, that we do every year on, in this case, it's E. coli fluoroquinolones. And you say the maps is, are getting in all countries worse and worse. So antibiotic use 
antibiotic resistance is fully out of control, is out of control worldwide, not only in humans, this is humans in hospitals, but also in, in animals. Here you see worldwide chicken, in pigs and cattle resistance is increasing all over the world in animals and in humans. So that's really out of control. They increase because we have an increase of resistance all over. You can see here that these resistance genes are in animals. Here we have sequenced, and you can see in the left panel, all the DNA which is in, in our guts, in humans and in pigs this time. And you can see that the pigs have much many more antibiotic resistance genes in their guts than humans, which means that there's a reservoir of antibiotic resistance genes within our animals. The same happens, by the way, in the poultry. And when we have a look at who is getting these resistances, we can see in this study that we uh, published last year, you can see that humans have many resistance genes. Yeah, human controls, you can see it on the left panel. And then you see poultry farmers, and they have statistically more antibiotic resistance genes in their gut. Where are these antibiotic resistance genes coming from? From, in, from these farmers. farmers? You see that in the poultry feces, there are more antibiotic resistance genes, but look how many antibiotic re resistance genes we have in the dust of the farms. So I use this um, to try to convince also the farmers, but also, also, the, also the vets, but mainly the farmers also, that the first people affected by antibiotic resistance is the farmer himself and his family. And the, the, the day after tomorrow, he will be in a hospital mm -hmm. ill and there will be no treatment, especially for him, because they have more antibiotic resistant genes in their lungs and in their, in their, in their, in their feces and in their intestine than the rest of the population. So especially, it's only, it's especially for them, for their protection to be, if they can be a bit egoistic, they have to control antibiotic resistance and use. And as I promised, and I will finish with this, what has happened with COVID? So especially in the first months of COVID, we didn't know very well how to handle uh, uh, these patients. And in some places of, uh, of the world, we still don't know very well. So this is the antibiotic use that, uh, and development in 2017, 2018, 2020, and suddenly in March, we have an incredible increase of antibiotic use. Not only in the whole country, as you see in the left, and with all the antibiotics, but especially with acetromycin, it increased 400%, at, but also many other antibiotics. Linezolid, cholestin, kephalosporins, tetracycline. So there's a huge increase that, uh, of antibiotic use with this crisis. So we are getting vaccinated. We will for, not forget this crisis, but we will get over it. But what will stay is antibiotic resistance. Even say, if I say this, I have also to say that my general spirit in life is optimistic. So I, we have been able in Spain to reduce, as you can see, cholestin antibiotic use in, in the last years. We got completely rid of using cholestin in a few years. And maybe we can discuss afterwards how we can, how we can do it. And the question is that in the European Union, the Green Deal is, has been signed. We are still discussing it. In fact, I was today invited to, to, to discuss this in, the, in, in, in Brussels. But the idea and the objective is that we will reduce still 50% of the antibiotic use by 2030. And we are already in 2021. So even if you have done a lot of efforts in your country to reduce, the idea is that overall in the European Union, we still reduce 50% of antibiotic use in agriculture. So there's still work to do. But I think also that this work is doable. I don't think it's impossible. So I think really that between the farmers, uh, vets, science also, and also the, 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 the farm, the industry, biosafety, et cetera, together, we can make it. So to finalize, the only way that we can manage this is to work together in a one health perspective. Bacteria don't stay in the animals, they flow from one place to the other. And this is something that we have to tackle all together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. Um, um, we will move over straight away to Nanderg's presentation. And after that, we we'll have a panel interview session with both speakers. Can you see my uh, presentation already? Yeah. Okay, perfect. You have to press the, uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak uh, at this uh, webinar. 
Um, I've been asked to talk today about uh, the team, the social concerns as market driver for uh, animal protein and especially looking into uh, a bit deeper on that team, how that is uh, potential going to change uh, business models uh, worldwide. So the idea is to give you in an, uh, yeah in, in 15 minutes an overview of uh, yeah how this is uh, is 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 already impacting uh, global uh, meat companies, and what 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 to expect maybe for the next uh, five to ten years. So to uh, to continue here actually the, the, the probably the best way to start is is looking into the long term perspective for animal protein. And as you all know, uh, meat uh, consumption has been uh, growing already for many years. Uh, we have an, uh, over, we, we had over the last 10 years, 20 years, 10, 20 years, we had a growth of 2% per year. Uh, we see changes between species. You can see that poultry and seafood are probably the fastest growing proteins. Uh, but also pork has been growing uh, quite uh, significantly. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 you see the drop now here in the last couple of years, you know, this is ASF in Asia. So this is the impact of ASF. It's now a bit recovering again. So if we look forward, we expect uh, the market to keep growing in the next 10 years by a half percent. So you need one half percent and you need 20% more uh, meat, um, um, which is a big challenge, of course. If you, if you look a little bit deeper there into uh, where this growth uh, will be, uh, it's going to be different uh, between region. And, and we have mature markets, uh, like you can see on this figure. So the dark, dark blue part is, uh, is pork consumption growth. So you see the link between uh, the, the, the development stage of an industry, industry mature, fast growing, and the, uh, and, and, you know, the industry structure, modern or traditional. Uh, so... We have mature markets, uh, EU, UK, low growth, uh, but also very fast growing markets in Asia, Latin America, uh, where, uh, for example, for chicken, you have markets which are growing 5% plus. For pork, probably the fastest growing are in South America, Central Asia, where we have around 3 4% per year predicted. Uh, but this is a big challenge, actually. So we, 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 we have to produce in the coming year probably more with uh, a relative limited uh, uh, availability of resources. So if you look uh, into uh, consumer behavior and how consumers are, um, uh, what sort of products and what uh, are buying in a different stage of economic development, this is a way how you can look into that. So we think there is a, is a strong relationship with, with, with income. So, uh, and meat is a relative expensive food um, item for, for consumers. So low incomes, we see a relative low uh, meat consumption, uh, traditional markets. Um, so uh, they cannot really afford them to buy uh, meat. Uh, so plant-based uh, protein is the main source. If incomes rise further, uh, yeah, you, you move in the next stage and then people have enough money to spend to increase consumption of meat. So this is Southeast Asia, this is Latin America, this is, uh, this is parts of Africa as well. So fast growing consumption of meat, uh, we see also changing behavior, uh, the people they shifted from, vet, for, from the live bird markets, wet markets into uh, modern uh, uh, formats like restaurants, uh, uh, supermarkets, so very bullish actually. So also here, um, health is becoming absolutely more other co consumer concerns, but it's starting. If you go further down, you enter in the stage of uh, mature markets where actually Europe, US, Japan are. And here uh, you see that people have reached probably a relative high level of consumption. Consumption growth is low, but people really ask more uh, about the producers in terms of um, of standards and about and, and, and social concerns are very important in uh, in that stage. So if you look at deeper there into these uh, consumer concerns, there are several ones actually. Uh, food security definitely, of course, in the first stages. Uh, so people are happy if they can get enough um, uh, food protein uh, to, to 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 get enough. Uh, 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 food uh, for themselves. But yeah, if you go further down, you see other, other concerns also rising. And then uh, probably first stage is health. Uh, later on, I think environmental friendly production, welfare issues. 
but they all get in more important in the process I showed in the previous slide is not a static one so it's changing so if people get more income and especially in, in cities it's often already the case people are going to ask more from producers and how you're going to see that well we think there are four items uh, that that are going to impact the industry in four different ways so the traditional one is regulation uh, for, for example in antibiotic use or standards for farms you know that's the government set but increasingly more we, we see differences actually and ngo is playing their role there and it's, they are operate more globally so they are pressing um, uh, consumers, producers, about standards, governments. Uh, so we see more uh, customer standards in the market, but also company specific um, uh, labels, brands, concepts, which are changing the market. So my idea is, is to go to, to a few of these uh, developments that we see. And first of all, uh, it, it is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's the animal welfare uh, topic, which is a, a very pro prominent driver for change in the ag sector where we see uh, the laying hand housing standards changing. So uh, this left-hand side gives you an idea about a production system in different countries. And you know, 2012, we had the European uh, cage ban. Uh, and, uh, and now, you, so, so the traditional cages are, are, are phased out in Europe. But you see it's moving to other parts of the world, especially in the Western markets, but also increasingly more in, um, in, 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 in emerging markets as well. And, and, and for the other markets than Europe, it becomes much more driven by customers, actually. So you see at the right hand side, some commitments taken by supermarkets and restaurant chains in the US, it, also the timing. Uh, so it's going to be big, actually. So we, we think that around 2024, 2025, the uh, uh, conventional cages uh, are uh, phased out in the US. So the industry is very much in a rebuilding uh, state uh, at the moment. So, and the other fact also related to animal welfare is the trend to a different production breed, uh, slow growing birds, uh, but it can also be other ones, but slow growing birds, probably the fastest growing part here. Also here, I think it's it's a lot is originating for, from Europe. France is already doing this for many years with Cetive, with La Brugge, uh, but it has been now also adapted by some supermarkets or by, by restaurant chains as a standard, minimal standard. So you see, for example, in the Netherlands that in a couple of years time, the total uh, supply to supermarket changed to minimal uh, slow growing birds. So regular standard birds have been taken out and that has become the standard. So it's really, uh, customer driven change and gradually it is moving in most countries it's more i think that at the moment that producers are introducing standards to differentiate the product but likely you get also more customer uh, involvement in this uh, market that they are going to especially branded company are going to apply this as a as a minimum standard in the market then a third uh, uh, change, uh, also related to social change, uh, the antibiotic uh, re uh, concerns. Uh, also, their uh, customers have taken their uh, lead or the lead in this development in the US. Uh, so left hand side uh, gives you the, 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 the road uh, that the US industry or US food service companies, but also poultry producers have been taken to change their standards. Uh, so right hand side, you see there, uh, you see there the, the food service restaurants and when they change their um, system and what, what level uh, they are asking uh, from their uh, clients. At the right, left hand side, you can see also producers actually also introduced uh, uh, higher standards, partly because of, uh, of, of branding, uh, but also in, in some cases for the complete uh, supply of, of a company actually. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combined way of producers, customers changing their standards. And if you look right hand side, you can see how massive impact this has been has had in the US on uh, antibiotic uh, use in the uh, industry. Other sectors in the US, uh, beef, pork, uh, are still uh, 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 behind this trend. And, uh, but I will change in my view as well. And, and, that this, and that this is related to this sort of scorecards that are monitored among um, uh, restaurant chains in the US. So you, you, the, the big restaurant chains, they get a classification in, uh, in, uh, on, on antibiotic uh, programs. 
and you can see here uh, that uh, yeah, there are still challenges in the beef sector. So I believe this is also going to change in the, in the coming years. So also these sectors, they are going to face more pressure on the big um, uh, uh, change uh, to, 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 to adapt this, uh, this sort of uh, standards. If this is only uh, a topic of uh, emerged uh, uh, market, no. Uh, if, if you look, for example, to the, US, the Chinese market, uh, the poultry market in this case, antibiotics has been a major concern uh, for, for the business and is, is in my view an, 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 a key reason why uh, the chicken industry has, hasn't shown the growth that probably some people believe so here you see the development blue uh, line is a white feather boiler uh, demand in uh, in China. And you can see it has been dropping uh, 2014. There was a big antibiotic scandal related to food service. It's, it, I think it was KFC. Uh, and, uh, and that really hit the image uh, of, of the product actually. So you saw that the industry has been struggling for many years has started to recover 2019, but it was also related to ASF. There was shortage in the market, you know, you know that actually. So, but it shows clearly that, uh, that this sort of worries are also important in uh, emerging market. Look to another factor, which is a little bit away from the topics I discussed before. I think it's also important to look to the whole uh, way how, how, how consumers are behaving actually and, and social media is changing everything in my view. So it has big impact on uh, the way how th people think, uh, the knowledge that they can get and also in confidence that people that, 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 the, 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 the society has in, uh, in, in opinion leaders, for example. So in the middle, you can see, for example, uh, an, an idea of in Germany and research uh, who people trust. So it's it's really it's it's not the, the the scientific scientific people. It's not the journalists. Not the business. It's affected people. It's NGOs actually, which is quite a challenging thing, of course, for industry if you want to bring a message. So you have to realize that this is important. Social media. You have to be active there as well. Other factor there is that online food is really booming. Uh, left hand side, you can see the curls. Emerging markets are probably even going quicker. Actually, Asia. I think home delivery is absolutely key and it's changing industries and probably the retail is never get the size like uh, the Western markets have been seeing because of the success of uh, uh, online uh, food delivery. And that's interesting because if you look to uh, the new technology that is coming up in the market, there is a lot of new things coming up and they actually, a lot of these tools that are coming up, smart farming, blockchain, robotics, genomics, gene typing, online, big data, they can perfectly match with the trend to online, to social media. I think that's an opportunity for the industry actually. And also it's going to be introduced in the coming years, also partly coming from producers. If you look to these tools, uh, I, I, I think we can, we can improve further in our way, how we are uh, managing efficiency uh, in, in the value chain. It's not only going to be focused on the financial technical one, but also in the future, I, I believe also attributes like animal health, welfare, environmental impact are going to be a lot more important. And with the tools you have, I think you can make big steps there in the future, actually. And that's going to be linked in the future also with branding. Uh, for companies, uh, getting more value out of uh, the market is going to be a key challenge. And uh, in that case, I think, uh, yeah, yeah you, you have to move up uh, into the, the value chain. So branding, uh, getting more value added uh, is, is going to be important. And that requires also different standards uh, for, for production because you have to differentiate. You cannot sell the same products. You have to tell a story, but also you have you need a different product actually. In that case, um, Standards, in my view, are going to be important. Uh, and in that case, the social concerns, they could be very good building blocks for a brand, in my view. So if you see these concerns, like food as a need, food safety, animal welfare friendly, environmental friendly, consumer health by local, you can play with this, actually, depending on the concerns of a consumer in a certain country, and you can build up a brand. For example, if you are in Colombia and link, you know that, for example, the health of the animal, local products are, are, are a big concerns of consumer, maybe, maybe combine it with the environmental friendly, you can build up a brand, in my view. And in other markets, probably animal welfare is more, more important. So, so that sort of, 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 of ways of thinking are going to be for sure a lot more 
important in the coming years. And of course, also the whole online food uh, movement are gonna mean also that value chains, they need to become a lot more open in what they do actually. And a lot of new tools will be introduced, value chain tracking and tracing, linking with social media, uh, with product, with scanning, uh, you can do that. Personalized advertisements, social uh, media to inspire Instagram or, you know, uh, all these other uh, uh, media, uh, meal planners, uh, DNA based food choices, personalized food advice, it all links with online actually. So we need to be prepared, realize that this also means that there could be a link to the way how you produce your products actually. And that links with the way the animals, you how you are farming the animals, but also antibiotic use and all these other social things. So in conclusion, um, expect change in the coming years and there are big challenges. And of course, food security is, is gonna be key in countries with low income, people are happy uh, they, they are uh, if they can buy them enough food actually but if you go further down actually you you can expect that 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 the way how the business are going to operate also what is going to be required for producers from society is going to change a lot actually and the social media online is going to play a lot of uh, impact of that also and also linking that with the new technology uh, the customer uh, positions uh, which are going to be taken much more in terms of CSR issues are in my view also going to be a more important so that's going to impact a lot the value chain so linking up society markets with new technology new standards uh, including antibiotic use is, is going to have a, a big impact on value chains and I think any producer in this business they need to rethink on how they are going to deal with these uh, changing market conditions that we are expecting in the coming let's say 10 years thanks for your attention thank you thank you very much uh non -Dirk. um we will be um, um moving on now to the to the pen panel interview uh, session and i would like to ask my colleague uh, andreas to to kick off with it. Yes. Um, Bruno, thank you. Um, this, your scientific work like uh, uh, um, fosters the awareness of relation between antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance. This is very important. Uh, legislation is following with regulation to mitigate AMR. There has been a clear push to reduce antibiotic use in the EU. EU yeah? A regulatory push to zero use is considered unrealistic by most of the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But one may ask the question whether there is eventually an acceptable level of antibiotic use. What is your opinion? Yeah, well, I agree with you. In fact, uh, and it's true uh, for those people that are aware of antibiotics, that antibiotics cause antibiotic resistance and we should avoid it, we all want to use less antibiotics. So, so where to set the limit? It's scientifically, it's not, it's not easy to say exactly at this point. It's similar like in pollution, for example, where you say, okay, we have to, how many cars do we have to reduce in order to have less pollution or to stop climate change? It's very difficult to say, 50%, 100%, difficult to set it. So that's why people take political decisions. So like it happened in the Netherlands, for example, where suddenly somebody said, okay, we will reduce 30% for, or 70% in three years. And, and then we see that, that that's feasible and possible. Also, also in cholesterol. The European and, and, Union, and Union recommended to reduce cholesterol a lot because it was used for human medicine. And they said, well, probably five kilograms per PCU is something that can be the aim of the people. And we in Spain, we even reduced it. So, so we have to reduce, but it's, and, 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 and you say, it's unrealistic to say zero. There are some, some, some in, I think the disease is unavoidable. So the disease will always happen. We, we raise our children in sterile apartments and uh, sterilize everything that we give them. And finally, there is a disease or even an accident. So that happens. Huh? So, but what, what, what we are doing, what the, the most modern industries in Spain are doing, and also in other countries, is to have like two lines. To, let, to have a line of production with zero antibiotics. And then as soon as I must treat a couple of animals here, I take them out of here and I put them to my farm where I produce, where I can still produce an, a, animals with antibiotics. You know, So this, this is what we are doing in a couple of farms. So probably everyone zero is not possible, is not realistic, 
But I know that we have brands, modern brands that look into the future and it's not the same as saying, well, the consumer is demanding it and also the companies and, and, and the retailers and so on. So there are lines that where zero is, and then if there's an accident or, or, or if a, a disease, then this, these animals are individually picking out of this line and put into another line where a bit of antibiotic use is, 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 is still possible. So there's always this trade-off between animal welfare, antibiotics, and to reduce it as much as possible. So overall zero, I think it's very difficult. And, and to, to have some production lines where you don't use antibiotics at all is possible. Uh, if I may, uh, from Nan Derek, um, in many markets currently with the COVID crisis, the focus is on retail sales. Um, there is a reduced, as a consequence, there is a reduced threat from, uh, from imports. Retail is typically supplied by, by fresh local products. So uh, furthermore, we see major investment in, in, in some modern farm system happening, particularly in um, formerly ASF hit countries like China and Vietnam. So Rabobank suggested in one of the recent reports that um, in the more consolidated markets, supply can be adjusted to, to local demand uh, with the leaders in the industry potentially playing an important role there. Now, you also spoke about uh, building a brand and, and, and taking advantage of the, of, of the situations. Can we expect that any of the industry leaders to take to, to actually take advantage and, and start building a, a brand based on customer concerns like those that you have uh, discussed, uh, including uh, perhaps also reduced use of, uh, of antibiotics? I think so. Uh, you, you know, the, 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 for example, in what we now see in Asia, the massive investments in the, in the, in the pork and chicken industry because of ASF, there is a risk uh, for oversupply, in my view, in the next couple of years. So if you are a, 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 one of the leading producers, uh, in my view, it is very important to, uh, to, to make sure that you are different from the bulk, actually. So you want to be in that situation out of the bulk part of the market because that is going to be price driven uh, and and the positive thing here as well is that in emerging markets uh, you know supermarkets are not so strong as in uh, in western markets like uh, the uk or um, uh, the us where uh, they dominate uh, the market actually and they want to prefer they want to work with private labels so I think if you want to develop a brand, you have to do it at that stage, actually. So that's going to happen in my view. And, uh, and, and, and then, of course, if you do that, yeah, you, you cannot sell the same product in the market because the consumers are going to see that. So you need to do something different. Consumers in these countries, they have, uh, they have already, of course, uh, 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 they have, the concerns are matter, I believe, there. Uh, health issues is, is a major one. I showed you China antibiotics, uh, the, the, the market trend. So I believe if you can uh, guarantee an, a product that, has an, uh, that, is, uh, that is, 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 is produced at a very uh, conscious way uh, there, I think you you, you can and you communicate that right with the consumer. There is a big opportunity in my view, and it's happening. There are companies that do that. We see also that in, for example, in China, blockchain is is one of is, is taking off uh, really a lot, and that's of course also a tool that you can use actually to 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 to, to get to, to build up trust uh, with consumers uh, about uh, how uh, produ products are being produced. In my view, so yes, I think that the near the combination with uh, uh, with uh, yeah, with uh, uh, the demand change, a brand, and the new technology is, is going to be, in my view, the, the, the success story for, for a lot of these um, countries. Bueno, yes. Well, yes, I, I, I think it's very well. The, the talk of Nandek was, was very nice, but I think it's very interesting to see how in different regions of the world, the driving force to get to, 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 to use less antibiotics is a bit different. So in Europe, sometimes we have this tendency of, okay, uh, the green uh, deal, or we have to reduce, and the government is, is taking a decision, and then the rest of the population is, 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 is reacting. But in some other places, and I think it's fine because the, the final result is good, it's the consumer. So it's like a bit bot bottom up, this, this social networks, or the consumers, they demand, look, I want this, and then the company says, yes, then finally I will sell this without antibiotics. And then suddenly we reduce antibiotics. And sometimes, no, and, and Derek, it's, it's driven by the industry and bottom up. Sometimes it's, it's top down, but I think that both are fine. I'm very happy with them because the result finally is that less antibiotics are used, no? 
Absolutely. And I think to add there as well, uh, there, is an, there is another factor which is also important there that's our branded uh, uh, companies, retailers, food service companies, and, uh, and, uh, and, and also food manufacturers also who have to, uh, yeah, who have a brand actually, and they are concerned that uh, there will be an issue with the brand. So also they are pushing a lot uh, the change in the market in my view so it's really the producers it's it's the it's the it's the customer food service retail and it's regulation as well indeed yeah i think um bruno you already touched it that that the information for antimicrobial resistance is transferred between strains yeah uh, but this is very important and interesting so amr develops as you said under the, the pressure of a a, a, a um, uh, antibiotics use yeah and uh, the abundance is of the resistance is also related to that um, um, but what about the dissemination of amr within species and also between different bacterial species mm -hmm. other ways of transfer or what is the trend uh, the frequency of transfer in species and between species is that known yeah well yes uh, so and that's why I put that slide on 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 this on what we call conjugation. This is a horizontal gene transfer between bacteria because this is happening all the time. All the time, bacteria are sharing DNA genetic information. Uh, not only with this conjugation touching each other, but only all, all, all the time grabbing DNA from the environment. This is why also bacteria are the most successful living living beings on Earth. They are here since 4,000 million years. So they've been in the intestine of dinosaurs. They've been in, in, in the seas before the earth, before there was, so they've been here much, much more, much longer than us. So thinking as that we were able, uh, able to control them, taking one of, the, one of the weapons from nature and starting to use it clinically is of, 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 of course, absolutely stupid. Even, even producing synthetic antibiotics. We, we synthesized a couple of antibiotics, sulfonamides and so on, thinking that, oh yes, they have never seen this molecule. And then they, this will make it, you know, and then 0 0.1 seconds, bacteria become, seconds or days or whatever, bacteria become resistant to, to this to these antibiotics just by changing their, their DNA. So the DNA is so flexible, they change it, interchange it so fast that they become resistant to whatever. So so, the, so when I read some projects, or research projects, or some people that say, we are going to develop a bacteria, a, a, a molecule, that there will be no resistant. I try to be reluctant because even to vaccines and to whatever, bacteria become resistant and also viruses. So, so or transfer, as you said, is also very important. So this uh, bacteria transfer these resistance genes all the time and it's unstoppable. So that's why we have the tendency of avoid disease. So preventing disease is the best thing. And then once we have it to use as little as antibiotic as possible. May I take a follow up question there? So the, this also is a relevance for the human health. So this will also give rise to multi resistance strains. Is there really, you said it, it will happen. So is there really no way to fight this transfer of, uh, of bacterial antibiotic resistance genes between species? Well, uh, and the interesting thing of scientifically okay, of antibiotic resistance is that now suddenly many different alternatives in different places of the world are emerging to fight against antibiotic resistance. And in fact, there are some strategies that hinder transfer of antibiotic resistance genes between bacteria. So there are molecules that are being developed, some in, some in clinical phase, some is still in, 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 in research phase, that block the transfer of these genes from one bacteria to the other, so block the, the spread. So there are these original approaches that are being developed that don't kill bacteria, but, they, but, but, but hinder the spread. So that's quite uh, interesting, and maybe one day we will see it in the market. OK, thank you. Um, I have a question from uh, for Nam Dirk. Um, so, back to the current situation in the market, and uh, if we look at the rollout of the COVID nineteen vaccines, um, there is a prediction uh, published by by your, by Rabobank that recovery from food service and particularly the quick service restaurants can be expected in the second half of twenty twenty one. I think. Uh, um, um, Definitely in the in the in the Western countries where where vaccination is already started, um, as the demand from the quick re, quick uh, from the QSR increases, can we expect them to select their meat suppliers on uh, 
on the on the producers, let's say, reduce dependence on antibi antibiotics, because we have already seen this happening for some uh, QSR chains, in particular regions like in Europe. Um, there might be still a little of an oversupply issue in the beginning of that uh, recovery. Um, any any opportunity for um, for uh, restaurants to um, yeah to further uh, improve their brands or what? Yeah, what I think yeah, yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, yes, uh, I believe so. You, 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 you see that uh, I showed you that scorecard uh, in the, the presentation uh, where uh, the, the food service companies are ranked based on, uh, on uh, how they are dealing with antibiotics actually in the value chain. Uh, so they are already monitored there actually. Uh, I think for all sort of uh, social issues, it's, it, 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 it's priority. So it's also welfare. It is uh, environmental friendly. Uh, and I think uh, most of these companies, they have a strategy there, I think for, 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 for supply chain and antibiotics uh, is, is an important uh, part of, uh, of that whole, whole story. So you can expect uh, that that is going to be, in my view, in the future, more enrolled uh, internationally. Uh, a lot of these brands, and that it's not only in the restaurant you see a, a change, it's also in uh, among food producers. They uh, work with global uh, standards, actually, and they, uh, they want to operate as much as possible, I think, uh, worldwide with uh, relative similar standards. So you can expect that it's moving also in, uh, in other regions, in my view. So that is, uh, is, is, is if you look five, five, five to ten years ahead, it's going to be a lot more international, in my view. So there's a question also from the auditory, which I find very interesting and relates to Bruno's uh, areas, on, which I also had on my list. Is occurrence of antimicrobial resistance solely to be addressed to animal production? Yeah, well, that's, that's the classical question. And that's probably the, the question that has hindered us to take proper actions against antibiotic resistance in the 80s, 90s, 20s, uh, and, and, and the, the, the end of the of last century. So that's the classical blame game, you know? So, so that when people were, that were prescribing antibiotics and using antibiotics, and it's mainly vets and mainly uh, and, and medical doctors, where they sit together and then one, one saying, oh yes, you are using too many antibiotics in your pig farms without any control. And this is why we have so much resistance. But then, then, then the vet was saying, oh yes, but you are using antibiotics without pres prescription from the pharmacies and you are not doing antibiograms, you are just giving antibiotics so like this, looking, looking to the patient and whatever. So no. And then no decision was taken because there was no one health overall common approach to the problem. So then suddenly, uh, I will not say myself, but some of us, we said, look, stop blaming each other. Let's take action because the problem is getting worse and worse while we are here discussing what the, my fault or this is the other fault. So that's why we're taking the one health action. So we know that every single molecule of antibiotic that, that, that we use, wherever, even in, a, in the water, in a river or whatever, is potentially is driving antibiotic resistance, making the bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. So let's reduce all of us, the amount of, of antibiotics that we are using. And we are doing it. We are doing making efforts in animal health and we are making efforts in human health as well. We are reducing, in Spain, for example, we've reduced it, but also in Europe, in many countries, reduce the amount of antibiotics that we use in hospitals. We are making a lot of GP courses for GPs in Latin America, in Africa, to, to teach how to prescribe less antibiotics. So everybody must do an effort and stop blaming each other at every time that we talk about this. Good. Um, yeah, thank you for, um, for this. Uh, I would like to um, uh, move on to the, to the Q&A session of this uh, webinar. Mm -hmm. um, we have some questions. Uh, we received some questions from, uh, from our attendees. Um, we are going to try to address a couple of them, um, but we want to also respect the time. So uh, um, if any of these questions cannot be addressed um, yeah, uh, during the call, during the webinar, you can, um, you can um, uh, communicate to us, share your questions via this email address, webinar at ewnutrition.com, and then the questions will be directed towards, uh, towards myself and, uh, and Andreas, and we, we can facilitate the answering. So, so here I see 
One of them already Andreas pointed out, and that is the use of antibiotics. And, and then here's the, one of the, uh, 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 somebody that says, if it's true that the farmers have more antibiotic resistance genes and more risk of getting antibiotic resistant infection, shouldn't that be seen as an occupational hazard to be exposed to this antibiotic resistance genes and the dust and so on? I think that's not a stupid uh, uh, proposal. So in fact, I think it's true. Working with animals makes you, they make that you have a high risk, not only of having this dust and antibiotic resistance genes, also of getting some on other, 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 other occupational infections. And in fact, yes, I think that also this, uh, the exposure to the dust and to, the, to, to antibiotics could, we could, there are enough data to start a discussion about if this should be also a, an occupational hazard, I think. Yeah, well, we've seen also like um, in the Netherlands that if, if, if a pig farmer would be entering a hospital, um, he or she would be quarantined until the absence of an MRSA uh, um, bacteria was, was confirmed. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this, is, um, this is directly related with, uh, with them, with their job, with their, with their yeah, so definitely there is an impact there on, on how you are treated in society, uh, mm -hmm. even. More questions, Dan Dirk, do you, do you, there's one maybe for you now or not? Uh, or if it's, or... Yeah, probably the, the question about risk that governments will take over consumer labels. Um, I don't think so, that that's going to happen, actually. Uh, it, is, uh, it is, I think there are some very high standards, which are probably uh, like the uh, no antibiotics ever. Uh, I don't think that is, uh, that is likely, that is going to be taken. I think there are some early adapters, companies who can do that. But um, I don't think that is going to happen, actually. Uh, there's uh, some reference there to GM. I don't fully get that, actually, that they, uh, yeah, some countries, you know, in, yeah, maybe it's, it's referred to Russia or so, but... It is. Uh, I don't think that that risk is really uh, existing in the in the in the short to midterm term. Mm -hmm. And I think there are also the proactive uh, attitude of the industry can also uh, uh, prevent it and, and make make the industry stay in the in the in the in, yeah leading this right. I mean, if you are um, if you are not responding at all, then you have a higher risk. I, I think that governments will take over. And uh... yeah, that's right. And it's also, I think, linking to, because, you, you know, I, I showed the example of China, which I think is a, is a, is a, is a perfect uh, example of, of, of showing how big the concern is. It's also the opportunity, actually, for you as an industry to, 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 get to, 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 to address the concern and to help uh, the market uh, recovering again, actually, and growing again. And so it helps you also in, uh, in I think, in your sales uh, perspective as well. Yeah. Uh, there's one technical question at the end, uh, Bruno, uh, to challenge you here on uh, AMR. Um, some producers decide to use specific classes of antibiotics in broiler breeder or in sows and, and using another class in their offspring. So um, this is to reduce the risk of, of, of treatment failure. Uh, in your opinion, is, does such approach make sense? Or I think, yeah. So I, it, it doesn't solve, especially because if you do it always, then then uh, uh, we have something that is called co-resistance. So uh, as, as I said, the bacteria change this DNA structures that they are called plasmid, they change it. And they normally they don't have one antibiotic resistance genes, they have many. So bacteria then transfer not only resistance to one antibiotic, but to many at the same time. But but the approach is not bad. In fact, it's also in human medicine, it's also it's also recommended. It doesn't hinder the use of antibiotics, or it, it's it's not the, the solution, and, that, and that's to change the, the types of antibiotics that you give to a patient if he's a lot of a lot of time in the hospital. So I think that this this is one possible. It will not minimize, but it helps a bit to use different families of antibiotics. But be also careful that not always the different antibiotic means a different family. Because many times, it's, if, it's, if it's the same family, if it's a better lung time and a better lung time, then it will not have very much. It must be really different families with different resistance mechanisms. And there, it can help a bit. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I believe we have uh, reached the end of the hour. So um, to respect the time of all the attendees, um, uh, I think it is time to um, to close off. Um, yeah, some of these questions uh, uh, that were submitted were actually not uh, not addressed yet. So please submit resubmit them through the through the um, email address that is indicated here. Um, we will be uh, uploading the recording of this webinar onto our website ewintuition.com within the coming coming days. You can you can find it there and uh, you know also uh, um, share it with uh, colleagues and uh, and friends who you um, um, so that they can go there and watch the recording uh, at any time. Um, I would like to thank you all very much uh, for. Um, for attending and also many thanks uh, to the two uh, um, uh, presenters. I think we had uh, two very nice uh, presentations, very complimentary and, and help and helping us to, to look at this important topic and other related sustainability issues from, uh, yeah, from, from two different angles. Um, so thanks very much. I, stay safe, all of you uh, there and um, keep up the good work. Bye for now. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye.